Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How's everyone doing? Alhamdulillah. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. I want to begin with a question. If you could wish for one thing today, what would you wish for? Let me add a little more to the question. If you could wish for one thing for the ummah today, what would you wish for? Let me share with you a beautiful, beautiful story. It was reported that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an one day was sitting with some companions and he said, Tamanno. He said, Wish for something. Share your wishes. And one of the men said, I wish this house that they were in was filled with gold so that I can spend it in charity for the sake of Allah. Look at this beautiful wish. Maybe when I asked you the question, some people would wish for what? I wish I had a billion dollars. I wish I had a mansion. I wish for my desires to be fulfilled. This Sahabi said, I wish there was a house full of gold so I can spend it for the sake of Allah. He said again, Tamanno. Go ahead, somebody else, wish for something. Second man said, I wish this house was filled with pearls and with every kind of precious gem so that I can spend it in charity for the sake of Allah. Umar radiallahu anhu said a third time, Tamanno. And they said, we don't know what to say. Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, O leader of the believers. Ma nadri. We don't know what to say. It's as though they know he's asking them because he wants to share something important. So he said, Radiallahu an, he said, I wish that this house was filled with men the likes of Abu Ubaidah al Jarrah, Radiallahu an. Allahu Akbar. Why Abu Ubaidah? Because Abu Ubaidah was a real man. Because Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an was of the highest quality human beings you could meet. Because he was truthful and trustworthy. Because of his character, because of his piety, his knowledge, his actions. Radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, every nation, every ummah has its amina, has its trustworthy person. And the amin of this ummah is Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an. Why Abu Ubaidah? What can we learn from this as it leads to the hadith of the day? It was mentioned that Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an one time was with a group of companions. Someone came, a group came from Najran. This is a community that had uh, some people convert to Islam. They came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and when they were going back, they said, send with us someone who is trustworthy. Do you know what he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I will send with you someone who is trustworthy, a man of trust, a man of trust, a man of trust. All the companions are eagerly looking. Who is this man of trust? Three times, a man of trust. And they said it was Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an. Aisha was asked radiallahu anha, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi leaves this world, who would he have nominated as a successor? This is a very big question. A question of leadership and piety and knowledge all in one person. Who would the Prophet assign as a successor? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said Abu Bakr. They said, who after that? She said Umar. Who after that? She said Abu Ubaidah. And then the hadith says, and then she remained silent after this. Brothers and sisters, a lot of people today want to be leaders, but they do not know what Islamic leadership is. A lot of people today want to be at the forefront, in the spotlight, but they don't know what it means to be at the forefront of Islam. A lot of people today want to be influencers. They want fame and following, but they do not know the responsibilities that a Muslim has when they have a position of influence or a platform to impact many other lives. A lot of people today say they want to be great leaders, but that they cannot be followers. And to be a great leader in this ummah, you must be a great follower. First, a follower of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, you cannot be a great follower of a great leader unless you have an ultimate role model that you imitate and emulate and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the blueprint you want the solution you want to know how to become a greater human being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear in the Quran when he says to us 
لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا. Indeed, you have in the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم an excellent role model. An excellent role model, an example. For whom? Is it for everyone? For whoever has hopes in Allah's pleasure, they're looking for Allah's pleasure. And for those who are attached to the afterlife, al-akhirah. This is such an important part of the conversation about leadership and being fit for leadership in Islam. Now you know when you study the biography, the seerah, you know what it means to be a great husband, a great father, a community member, a friend to Muslims, to non-Muslims, and even non-Muslims at times have attested to the fact that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the greatest leader in history. We learn as Muslims from the following hadith how important it is to be fit. And I don't mean just physically or to be fit, rather as believers, ready in every situation. In the hadith that is the crux of my reminder today, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every time you hear his name, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Innama nasu kal ibli al mi'a. Indeed, people are like a hundred camels. لا تكاد تجد فيها راحلة. Perhaps you will hardly find a single one that is fit for riding. One, hardly, one for every hundred that is fit for riding. What does this hadith mean? Let's unpack all the lessons, the traits that we need, inshallah ta'ala, our children need, and onwards every generation needs to improve the state of this ummah. The people of virtue are less in number. The people of quality, real quality, are less in number. They are not the majority. And what are some of these traits? Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, for those who know, he put this hadith under the, ta the, the title, the chapter title, the disappearance of amana, trust. That people will stop being trustworthy. This is a very important positioning of the hadith. Why? It means that generally, the people who are really honest all the time, trustworthy with the highest levels of trust, in what way? In terms of a dunya and in terms of the akhirah are less in number. May Allah make us and our children and our loved ones amongst them. Allahumma ameen. A recent scholar, he said an example is this. When you look to fill a vacancy for a judge or an imam or a teacher, a leader of any organization, he says, if you really thoroughly investigate the needs of that position, and the qualifications of the people you will find, most people are not qualified. Most people cannot fulfill the amana of that position, the responsibility of serving people. And this hadith that we're taking, the one in 100 camels, it's not about the first three generations, it's not about the sahaba, it's about later generations. The Prophet ﷺ warned them and warned us about what will happen to this world when he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, there will come after you a people who will bear witness without being asked to do so. They will be treacherous and untrustworthy. They will make promises and will break their promises. And obesity will appear amongst them. I mean, they are attached to the materialism of a dunya and their desires. They follow whatever desires they have. So today, when you look to fill a position in your organization, you look for someone trustworthy to watch your child, you look for something important to be fulfilled as a vacancy, you have to thoroughly investigate. And we need to ensure as we are investigating to bring up the best of people, we need to ensure the measures and mechanisms are in place to train that next generation, to mentor the next group. Because if the one in power is not qualified, like many people in the world today, in many governments and many organizations and politicians and others, if the one in power is not qualified, how do you know the one who will replace will be qualified? If their example is one of corruption, one of bribery, one of injustice, one that is far from Allah, Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reality today. Now, our ummah benefits by investing and investigating these matters of mentorship. What does it mean to bring people together, to teach long term, develop people in different ways? So let's go back to the first question I asked you. What would you wish for? And I'm going to say something that might bother some people. It might come off the wrong way. I don't mean it with a bad intention. Do you know what would really benefit our Muslim American community today if a lot of board members in a lot of organizations resign today. What would benefit us today as a community 
is if a lot of individuals, which individuals? Those who are not fit for that position. Those who are not fulfilling that amana. Those who do not belong in that place. Move out of the way of the power hunger that they have and bring somebody qualified to lead. And I want to make it very clear so there are no misunderstandings. A lot of people want to tear down every kind of leader, every imam, every teacher, every organization. All they do is criticize and look for flaws. That's not what I'm doing here. Rather, the point is not advocating for tearing down what is good. The point is removing what is bad, what is weak of leadership so that we can build and develop what is good for our ummah, for the foundation of that leadership. Wallahi, one position in this ummah has the potential to impact millions of lives. So how about that person standing on the day of judgment, questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the amana that they took, they held on to and they refused to let go of when somebody more qualified was nearby, was able to lead, was fit for that position. There are people we have heard say, I refuse to let go of my position. I deserve to be a board member, a politician, and this and that because I donated 50,000. I did this, I did that. That is not a qualification of leadership. You must know how to lead your community, and that requires a comprehensive understanding of what Islam is, what responsibility is, what leadership is about, and being detached from power. We do not desire power in Islam, but rather, if power is given to someone, as a test that they pass that test through humility and servitude. In Islam, to lead is to serve. To lead is to serve. To lead is to serve. It is not serving your interest. It is not about your fame. It is not about your desires, your credit, your status, your bio. It is about serving other people, knowing Allah will question you for that position. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ if you take the Prophet ﷺ as a role model, you're taking him as a role model because you are seeking Allah's pleasure and you're looking for the afterlife. You're looking at Jannah. Your heart is not attached to this life. When you are not attached to this life, you do not care about positions and status and names and labels and credit and fame. You're no longer afraid that people will criticize you because you're doing what is pleasing to Allah. And there are so many examples. Here's an example. How many people here are supporters of Palestinian sovereignty? As an example, raise your hand. How many people here are in support of Palestine? Alhamdulillah, there's no problem saying that. You're not ashamed to raise your hand. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the affairs of our brothers and sisters in every land and every place. You are not afraid knowing that when you advocate for Palestinians, by criticizing Zionist occupation. You're not afraid that you're going to be given a false label in this world. You're not afraid by advocating for the Uyghurs in East Turkestan that people will criticize you or certain people will hate you for doing that. You're not afraid to speak out against the government of India that is slowly and gradually attacking the rights of Muslims in India. You're not afraid to talk about liberalism and the reality that it is illiberal when it comes to Muslims in America and that we are forced to claim that we are tolerant people when in fact we are the most tolerant of people upon the truth. You're not afraid. Why? You care about Allah's pleasure. You care about the akhirah. You are not attached to what people are saying and doing, but you do so in the wisest manner possible. You seek justice. You speak the truth. You advocate for causes in the wisest, most strategic manner possible to convince others that this is correct. To convince others this is what we are looking for. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst them. Allahumma ameen. One time, there was a college-aged brother, a young student, part of young Muslims actually. He was looking at his phone as we were standing together and he was mumbling something. He read something on his phone. He started mumbling. We asked him, what's going on? And he said, I'm in a dilemma. So I was just repeating, how would Allah want me to respond? How would Allah want me to respond? The greatest leaders, the greatest leader, the Prophet ﷺ taught his companions, always reference Allah. Never leave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the discussion, out of the equation. Never leave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the references that you make in every hour, every sitting, every gathering, every discussion, every strategy, your job, your studies, the raising of your child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is central to our lives, central to success. We were created to know Allah. We were created for la ilaha illallah. And you just saw five people embracing Islam. Alhamdulillah, this is what we were created for. And when we see these opportunities and we see these signs and reminders, we realize it's not easy 
to be amongst those mentioned in this hadith. One in a hundred, hardly one in a hundred that are fit in terms of quality, that are fit in piety, that are fit in their character, that are people who are trustworthy. And the reality here, another lesson is that you are there for people. You're there for other people. How many people today are connected on social media to thousands of friends, so-called friends and followers, and they have family in their houses, they have parents who are there for them and have raised them, but this person feels more alone than ever before. They feel so alone. How many people, mothers and fathers, abandoned by their children in this individualistic society that focuses on materialism in a very selfish manner after working 18 years, 20 years, 30 years, raising that son or that daughter, loving them with sincerity and well-being for them. And some people will criticize the ummah, the, the du'at, the organizations, the scholars, but they're never there. They never volunteer. They're not part of any community. Some people sit behind their computer screens, behind their phones, criticizing, refuting, looking for flaws in every part of the ummah. But wallahi, when you need help, when you need volunteers, this person is the farthest person away from it. They will never volunteer. They will never show up to the masjid events. They will never be part of helping other people, alleviating the affairs of others, but they are so happy to criticize. They're happy to tear down other people. They expect when someone wrongs them, everyone should come to my defense but they do not want to be there for other people. Another lesson from this hadith is we all have a role to play. Leadership is very interesting. We know from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu everyone is a shepherd over some flock. The father, the husband, the mother has a role, the children have a role, everyone has a role. You might be part of an organization, a non-profit, an Islamic center, you may be part of an MSA, young Muslims, you may be part of any movement or you may be a mother raising your children. You are leading your children to success. When you lead your child to success, you're leading the ummah to success. And the reality here, I'll give you an example through a story. There's a sister, a mother of six in one of our communities. She said, I feel like I have no role or value as a mother when I hear a hadith about leadership because that's one side of the discussion and the other side is the people around me who tell me that if I don't have a corporate job and I'm super successful at the corporate level, that I'm not capable of being a leader. If I'm not outdoors or on social media or an activist, then I cannot be a leader. And wallahi, this is one of the greatest lies against women and against motherhood in particular. Why? Today, as we have seen for the last decade and two, and longer than that, but especially in the last 20 years, there is a war being waged against motherhood in terms of its value. And Muslims may be impacted by this ideology, by these attacks as well. There is a war against the value and role of mothers in society, raising that child and never paid by a dollar or a penny, knowing that the reward is with Allah and that they are raising the next generation. So I will say very explicitly, there is no ummah without an um, a mother. There is no ummah without an um. Wallahi, there is no ummah without an um. There is no success for our ummah or our communities and all of these organizations if there are not present mothers present for their children, loving them as our mothers have. May Allah reward them with the highest ranks of Jannah. Our mothers have a priceless role in Islam, a priceless obligation and responsibility. And this is not to say that they cannot do other things, but that motherhood itself is one of the greatest things in this world and the payment. You're not going to be seen in a corporate space because you raise your child. You're not going to be rewarded by the legal system because you raised your child. You're not going to be given credit from other people because you raised your child and you will not be paid financially for raising your child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you an opportunity, a ticket to Jannah through every child that you raise with love, with security, with mental stability, upon Islam with the right understanding, the right morals, the right character, the good friends, the right teachings, giving them a high standard of Islamic knowledge as well, knowing that that child, that one child, wallahi, can change the entire world just as the mother, the single mother of Imam al-Bukhari raised one of the greatest legends in history, she's being rewarded for that as well. The mother of Imam Ahmad being rewarded as well. Brothers and sisters, the last thing that I'll say about this hadith, it's about people who do not desire power. 